Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Well, hello and welcome to Garden Success. We are glad you're listening, as we always are. Uh, Today, I'm coming to you by tape. I am actually gallivanting around somewhere in the world right now. And uh, instead of being live, which we normally are, uh, we're coming by tape. So uh, I won't be telling you the number to call. Don't try to call in today unless you just like to hear the phone ring because (laughs) we're not going to be answering it today. But we are glad you're listening, and I think we have a really good show for you and one that is is super timely. Uh, My guest is Michael Potter. Michael is the horticulture agent in Montgomery County over in Conroe. Uh, Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Uh, Glad to be here. Michael and I are cohorts. We we do the, the similar jobs in different counties. And Michael really focuses a lot on on issues with turf. And uh, so I I would wanted to have him come in as a resource and just be able to kind of pick his brain and and discuss what do we do now that we just went through the summer we went through. And I'm saying we're through it because I think you have heard me say this before, but if it drops five degrees off of 100, it's fall. It's, I'm, yeah. I'm calling it fall. Yeah, exactly. 97 <laughs> degree days feel good. That's, it, it sure <laughs> does. It sure does. And our plants uh, feel that way too. We get a little bit of rain here, Michael, uh, in the last you know couple of weeks here and there. So yep. Just small yeah. amounts. So that that's really good. But uh, Michael, first of all, I always like to ask uh, guests, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you began over uh, across the pond in Hawaii, right? And just well, give us a, yeah. a kind of a quick how'd you get here? Yeah, born and raised in, in Corpus Christi, Texas, and and uh, graduated high school there. And and um, parents decided that they wanted to go do some stuff over in Hawaii. My my dad was kind of a developer and stuff, so we moved over there. And uh, I needed a job, so I started. Uh, begging around uh lo and behold my my dad's family friend is his wife worked for usda plant Mm. protection quarantine and so i i kind of began there even though i did jobs and stuff for you know my mom was in real estate so Mm -hmm. i got to clean houses and yards and do stuff as a kid and mow and do all that kind of stuff you're building your character exactly and and by the way he is quite a character (laughs) Sorry. I try to. I only take after my mentor. <laughs> oh my gosh! All right. So anyway, we're still in Hawaii. Yeah. So I went to Hawaii. Worked for plant uh, USDA plant protection quarantine for a couple of years, and just really dove into. Hey, I really like this horticulture stuff. Yeah. And and really, my ultimate goal when I started going to University of Hawaii Hilo was to go back into USDA. Mm-hmm. And um, lo and behold, I just it was one of those things where love struck. I ended up moving back to Texas, ah. uh, finished all my degree at Texas A&M Kingsville. Mm-hmm. Um, and then immediately after graduating my bachelor's, I got a, a, a job with um, the, uh, well, I got a job. When the first thing when I moved over there, I started a nursery mm-hmm. and uh, I was a supervisor for the, all the, you know, perennials and things like in trees and et cetera. And then, you know, just kept working around and got a job at the lab over mm-hmm. in Kingsville. And then, and then uh, my brother-in-law calls me up one day and says, hey, there's a job over here at the extension office. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? And he said, was just look into it. So, all right. So lo and behold, um, I have a kind of diverse background with everything. So I've got some range pasture cattle. I've got a whole bunch of different things that I've done over the years. Uh, so I started there in Oasis County as a result demonstration assistant, mm-hmm. which was a fully county funded position uh, working with the ag agent. Mm. So we had row crop research trials that we did that were, you know, cotton, corn, uh, sorghum, uh, and range and pasture herbicides. So I've got a lot of different background. Um, but what struck me is that when I started um, in 2006, I was the horticulture agent. I started as a horticulture agent there in Montgomery County. Turf grass was kind of my thing. Mm-hmm. And I just, I said, you know, I want to dive into this. And I, and I think I, I had a stack probably about a foot tall on my desk of research mm-hmm. and just stuff, just digging into it deeper and deeper, trying to yeah. figure out things. Because as we know, as horticulturists, mm-hmm. we get trees, turf, and tomatoes, the yeah. three T's. Lots of those mm-hmm. questions. Sure and, do. and we get probably 90% uh, 
of our phone calls out of Montgomery County that are turf related. Mm-hmm. That's that's been my experience too. Wherever yeah. I've been, it's it's a it's a lot. Yeah. Well, then you were there for a while, but then you ended up taking the position over in Montgomery County. Yes, uh, my predecessor, and and as well as you've mm-hmm. been there as well. Uh, Tom Roy uh, mm-hmm. decided he was going to retire. My my wife got her PhD in education, so she found a job at Sam Houston State University. Oh, okay, and she said. Uh, uh, I hate to tell you this, but uh, I, I can't teach here in Corpus. I've got to move on. And I'm like, wow, horticulture, <laughs> where that's am a, I going? That's how I got to Texas. I was in Missouri for three years, mm-hmm. and I went to an uh, ASHS, Horticulture Science meeting. Mm-hmm. Uh, met Sam Cotner over there. Sam Cotner. And uh, Sam had told me about a job in Conroe, which is mm-hmm. the one right, you're right, now right, in. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I went home and asked ask my wife, are, are are you interested in moving back to Texas? And I heard car keys jingle and a car start, <laughs> and I had to run to catch the car before she got out of the driveway, or I'd have been left in Mountain Grove, Missouri. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah, so the answer was yes. She's yes, ready to go back. Was, to- yeah, it was good. I mean, it was funny. I, I called um, right after my wife told me, you know, she's going to you know, possibly do an interview and stuff. I called Tom, and I said, hey, do you by chance know anything up there for a horticulture, you know, kind of background person? Mm-hmm. He said, Michael, I'm retiring. And the funny thing was, is a couple of years before that, he introduced me uh, to his wife yeah. to, as his replacement. And I was like, oh, you're so full of it. You know, we know Tom and he yeah. likes it. You, you know, he likes to poke fun and stuff. And yeah. I was like, oh, no, that's never going to happen. Yeah. Well, never say never. So. And the rest is history. And the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. Well, uh, this has been a brutal summer for our yes. lawns. And there's just flat dead mm-hmm. lawns and dead plants and other things. Yeah. As a result of it, uh, here in College Station, I think, and this isn't the exact number, but it's like 55 days over 100 mm-hmm. in a row and mm-hmm. and just no rain for a right. long, long time. Yeah. Uh, and so we have some water restrictions that are still on here mm-hmm. in the area, uh, but it just became a thing where people couldn't water enough to keep it all going. Right. Yeah, and, and that, that's a lot due to evapotranspiration. Yeah. You have a lot of evaporation that occurs. And in, in some cases, I was seeing stuff where you had you had to apply like almost three inches of water to get one inch of water uh, that just, turf requires to survive. God, that's a lot. Mm-hmm. Well, I, so pe- people are trying to keep their turf going. And, and as a result... Other things came in. I think I've said this here on the air, but uh, I've never used insecticide or a fungicide on my lawn. And this summer, I saw this dead patch when I was gone for two weeks, and I thought, oh, it's drought. And then it kept getting bigger. <laughs> uh, and I finally had the sense to sit down on my hand or get on my hands and knees and look. And yes, chinch bugs and take all root rot was taking over where drought had left off. And right. uh, pretty serious, pretty serious loss. So. Well, let's talk a little bit. Will you talk a little bit about uh, turf grass and the yeah. the response to stress? You know, and comparing you know, like St. Augustine to uh, zoysia and Bermudas, mm-hmm. and and what happens? How far along can we go before we have a big problem? I know you were yeah. speaking to um, uh, our master gardeners here in Brazos County yesterday, mm-hmm. and uh, you had the little slide up there of the study in College Station. Mm-hmm. And so let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, uh, you know, I kind of like to describe this to folks to kind of help them better understand it's it's like you and i you know when we get worn out tired you know not lack of sleep and everything we get weak and Mm -hmm. and our immune system gets weak and you can kind of say the same thing for plants and whether it be turf grass or whatever it is so they become more susceptible to things Mm -hmm. Um, and then of course you add you know temperatures over 100 for x number of days it just it completely wears them down and makes them just more susceptible to any kind of Mm -hmm. you know insect or disease issue yeah um so that's what we're seeing a lot of we're getting a lot of those phone calls now of you know hey my yard's dead what is it Mm -hmm. you know in a lot of it you know lack of water but then you have secondary things that come in like your chinch bugs and Mm -hmm. and that come in and and start to kind of tear it down even more yeah so you know you've got a it's one of those things that you kind of have to look ahead of time and say okay you know what's going on if it's something that starts and the way i kind of look at it i I back up and i go okay when did you first first start seeing these Mm -hmm. symptoms and they say oh you know it was probably in april or may Mm -hmm. well then i can start to kind of narrow it down and yeah. say, okay, this could be take all root rot, you know, yeah. it could be, you know, oh, it started off as yellowing and then the grass just slowly recedes mm-hmm. back. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's things or indicators, I kind of mm-hmm. call it CSI for plants. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. And, and, uh, 
the the when the grass is dying back like that, you know, the St. Augustine, it it basically lives above ground. Of mm -hmm. course, the roots are in the ground, but mm -hmm. uh, the only place it can regenerate growth is sitting on top of the soil. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the Bermuda and Zoysia, yeah. they have the right ability for rhizomes, rhizomes. And, and things where maybe you know, I mean, if you fried the top, it, as long yeah. as the soil had some moisture, mm -hmm. it could survive and pop back out again. And you know, and like. Bermuda grasses, you know, most of the, some of the hybrids are a little different, but like common Bermuda grass. Um, one of the studies that was done years ago with San Antonio water system saws, mm -hmm. they did like a three year study and they were showing the recovery yeah. after a 60 day drought on, you know, X, X depth soil in the middle of summer, in the middle of summer where they had this big rain out shelter that said, mm -mm, you're mm -hmm. not getting any water. Uh, you know, Zoysia and St. Augustine took about 78 days to fully recover. Mm. It was funny, though, Bermuda, mm -hmm. after about 14 days, it was 90 plus percent recovered. And where they started was the key. Mm -hmm. and, and I always teach classes you know, when it comes to, to, to turf grass is greenest to brownest. Mm -hmm. and, and it kind of it kind of mirrored that. It yeah. showed that, hey, these St. Augustines actually stay green. Mm -hmm. um, even in uh, when we had the big, uh, you know. I, I the fry, uh, was it free apocalypse or whatever people call yeah. it. You know? <laughs> February twenty one. Yeah, it, you know, I, I was looking at my lawn and I'm like, you know, it, it's still green. Yeah. Um, but in some cases, you look at other lawns and they weren't. Yeah. And it depended upon whether they got moisture, so they had that exothermic reaction of heat. Well, when when I'm looking at lawns and seeing dead grass, yeah. and what, most lawns are St. Augustine, mm -hmm. and you know, I. To go through all three turf on every thing we yeah. talk about is a little cumbersome, but mm -hmm. most are St. Augustine. But when I see dead runners on top of the ground, I know it's not coming back. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll look for living sprigs or mm -hmm. anything. Uh, if you can get them healthy and they're, let's say, foot apart, mm -hmm. sometime in the next season you can get a, a, rec a fully Full recovered, recovered area. Mm -hmm. But if you've got to go 10 feet to find the next sprig, right. it's time to bring in some sod for sure. Right. In fact, that's kind of my rule of thumb as well. Uh, if you got about 10 square feet, mm -hmm. that's when, hey, let's go ahead and dig up that area, you know, yeah. soften that soil up, you mm -hmm. know dig down a little bit because we don't want a high spot, so to right. speak, and then go ahead and, you know, resod those areas. Mm -hmm. But then comes the next step, yeah. the watering. Yeah, the watering. Mm -hmm. To establish it, you really, ha you know, wet yeah. the ground before you put it down, make sure it's nice and, you know, yeah. nice and wet, put that sod down, and right. then begin the watering process of, of weaning it off as well. Uh, I, I'm, th I'm thinking here in the College Station area, we still could plant sod now. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to give it as many weeks as possible to root in. And when we start getting into later in the fall, let's say November, mm -hmm. the, the grass rooting activity is really going right. down right. for winter. And so putting sod out then, it's kind of like the sod sits there all winter mm -hmm. and waits till spring to be able to get roots down. Mm -hmm. And th that's not a good thing. But maybe if, if you did it today or tomorrow, yeah, yeah well, yeah, <laughs> went ahead and got it done, mm -hmm. that you could probably get two or three weeks of right. getting it at least rooted in, right? Or just wait until spring. Yeah, exactly. And, and and you know that's the that's the thing too, Mother Nature. <laughs> we can predict, but yeah. we can't. No. You know, uh, as long as you get three to four, you know, weeks of of mm -hmm. having it down, and allowing it to get some root system down mm -hmm. and everything, you've got some time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would say within a week. Mm -hmm. If if you were to do it, you could probably get it established yeah. somewhat to the extent that it'll make it through the yeah. winter, unless yeah. Mother Nature intervenes and says, "Here we go." So another, you know, we talked about sprigs and mm -hmm. recovering. Uh, my concern with that approach is if there's take all on those sprigs, they're not going to have the the juice and the vigor to really, Recover. you know, yeah. be, be strong and regrowing. And that's another advantage of waiting until spring mm -hmm. is you probably get a little better look at what you really have going on in the lawn. You know, right. once it once we hit about April 1st here, we're getting some some green up and mm -hmm. it's starting to move. Mm -hmm. By mid-April, we are probably mowed it twice. Right. Yeah. Mid-April yeah. to May, some years. Um, mm -hmm. The one thing that, you know, establishing turf grass in the fall can be an issue with is it, when we do have these early cold fronts mm, yes. that drop those temperatures at yeah. night and we start to get, you know, take all patch, mm -hmm. I mean, excuse me, large patch or brown patch, mm -hmm. uh, we start to get those scenarios show up. Yeah. Uh, you know, moisture, that right. you know, having those cool temperatures, you know, you got a fungus is always there. Yeah. It's just a matter of whether it's susceptible. So we're watering, watering, watering. So yeah. it could be adding to the problems. So. Yeah. And, and uh, a lot of the things we would do to get the grass going promote. Uh, large patch, correct. Uh, uh, brown patch. Mm -hmm. So, uh, one thing I've been talking about on the air is 
in spring and summer, we're looking at 312, 412 fertilizers mm -hmm. because we're trying to get the nitrogen in there to support good growth, to mm -hmm. make density and all that. Now that we're hitting fall, uh, we're wanting our, our number one goal isn't to get new growth mm -hmm. uh, bec because if you push it with nitrogen, uh, you're going to have more more issues with things like large patch mm -hmm. pus circles oh, show yes. up so much better yes. in a oh, green yes. lawn. <laughs> and they can get so, much larger, too. Yeah, they can. <laughs> uh, so things that have maybe a lower nitrogen, mm -hmm. maybe a 1-1 one, one nitrogen and potassium ratio, yeah. where we've got some nitrogen, which right. you need it to go on the plant with the potassium, right. uh, but not enough to just invigorate. Yeah. And, uh, and with that potassium, which helps with drought tolerance and cold tolerance, mm -hmm. If you can get your lawn stocked up right. in the spring, in the spring yeah. with the nutrients that it needs, mm -hmm. and I say nutrients, the the nutrients are the the uh, raw materials that the plant uses to make the carbohydrates mm -hmm. and other things that really run the show. Right. Uh, but getting that in the plant uh, is pretty important. Yeah. One of the things I think you and I laughed about is a lot of the stuff that says winterize your lawns. Yeah. Winterize. I, you know, over, yeah. I always have a slide in there with blankets on people's lawns. Yeah. You know, <laughs> do we really render, winterize? Yeah. You know, what we're really trying to do is, is trying to boost that plant and get yeah. energy into that plant mm -hmm. or at least fertilizer into that plant to where when they do come out and have spring green up, they've already got it in reserves. Right. They're already ready to boost up. That, and that is that is more important than people think. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a turf specialist years ago, I can't remember which, who, which one it was, but uh, told me that the most important fertilization of the year is the fall one. And yes. at the time it was like, Okay, okay, that's overstating it. I, I wasn't sure I believe that, but right. I do believe yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, because when it comes out in spring, uh, visiting with another one of our AgriLife Extension mm -hmm. Turf Specialists, the, they were talking about it coming out in spring. It's the stored energy that supports that's early it. growth. The mm -hmm. old roots that have gone through winter, mm -hmm. they're not very doing much. The new root development and expansion and stuff hasn't really begun mm -hmm. fully. And so going into fall strong is really, really important, mm -hmm. especially for lawns that survived but mm -hmm. aren't in great shape. Right. Yeah. And and, you know, the whole thing is, is that I, I look at, you know, some of the products that are out on the market and stuff, and there's some real high nitrogen stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and people want that green lawn. And yeah. It's like, you know, if you could just get them to realize, you know, hey, yeah. let's do a soil test. And let's see what really the grass needs according to a soil test. That's true. Soiltesting.tamu.edu. Yep. There it is. Yep. Get a soil test performed, and now you know exactly what you need. That That is that is truly the, the way we we give estimates. We give, mm -hmm. okay, I know nothing about your yard and soil. Mm -hmm. Use a 312 yeah. or use a 1-1 yeah. one, one in the fall or kind exactly. of thing. Exactly. And that's that's our best guess. Yes, We're right is. most of the time, yeah. but not all. Well, and, and I see the purpose of it. You know, 3 why do we why do we want such a little bit higher percentage of nitrogen mm -hmm. well because we're we're not growing vegetables we're we're growing a leafy vegetable mm -hmm. in a sense <laughs> we're yeah. we're growing leaves so you need that little bit higher nitrogen but that's more maybe you know for that spring application mm -hmm. I, th I think you know lowering that nitrogen application and, and using you know f utilizing the phosphorus and potassium mm -hmm. you know still having some nitrogen component there but allowing it to store that up for that spring is yeah. real important so this would be a time to do that of mm -hmm. course the number one driver of the turf is is water right. uh, you know the and i mean cycle <laughs> you can you know fertilizers yes they're important mm -hmm. pest control disease control right. concoction snake oil whatever you decide to put on your lawn mm -hmm. everything is right. secondary to water. water and if you give there are lawns that haven't been fertilized in two or three years mm -hmm. they're kind of chartreuse they're not mm -hmm. real dense right. but they're alive mm -hmm. Because they were given water. Water, that's right. <laughs> and if you switch that around, don't give it water, but give it fertilizer. Well, yeah, it's toast. Yeah, I, I, my my buddy that lives kind of down in the Richmond, Katy area. He calls me here occasionally and says, "Hey, you know what should I do now? What should I do now?" And it's funny that today he was like, "I got to mow." I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> you got some rain," and, and you know he's been watering, but yeah, it, it's it's treated water for us to drink. Right. And then when you get this rainwater, it's like rejuvenation. Mm -hmm. Hello, you know, mm -hmm. I'm going to grow and you're going to have to mow me. Yeah. And, and it, it does drive that cycle. Yeah, it sure does. And just judging from lawns I've crawled through, mm -hmm. uh, chinch bugs are still active. Yes. We expect them to kind of crash as we get into fall, but they're still there. They're still so active. if if you don't know what a chinch bug looks like, mm -hmm. uh, go online and search uh, yes. for a picture of a chinch bug. So yes. They're, 
there's young ones and old ones that look a little different. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you see that in your lawns, then it, it's really worth going ahead and getting an insecticide to shut that down right. because they're just continuing to take it down at mm -hmm. a time when we, as we've been talking about, need to be bringing it back up right. and strengthening right. it. So, you know, a lot of people are asking that question right now. You know, now that my grass is so damaged, what do I do? Mm -hmm. You know, well, you know, stay away from high nitrogen fertilizers. We don't mm -hmm. want to stress it out anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, tr try not to do too much. Mm -hmm. Try not to love it to death. Yeah. You know, that's the whole thing. Uh, we, we're getting some rainfall. It looks like we've got some more kind mm -hmm. of on the way. Uh, you know, so the grass is going to start to kind of regrow and start to kind of fill back in a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be as fast maybe as what we want. But, mm -hmm. you know, you got to think about it. We've had two years of, of summer droughts right. that have been, you know, last year. Not as bad as this year, but still. Well, and we, we mentioned large patch. Uh, I am I am frustrated with the fact that it's now called large patch, but everybody on earth knows brown patch. There's products that say brown, <laughs> brown patch, patch, fertilizers for brown patch and stuff. And so I usually try to say them both. And mm -hmm. I, I'm about to the point of just giving up and talking to the public, call it brown patch, even well, though that technically is not right. Well, it, it, I did a lot of little digging behind the scenes on it and trying to figure it out what what they did find out though there's two different strains mm -hmm. over isaac mm -hmm. and one affects cool season grasses mm -hmm. brown patch mm -hmm. the other one affects warm season grasses mm -hmm. grasses large patch mm -hmm. guess what we got both <laughs> well we even have some summer patch some mm -hmm. rhizoc mm -hmm. in the summer that right. can can be an issue mm -hmm. well so we're not going to over fertilize with nitrogen for right. that uh but talk about how large patch circles occur what's happening and timing for, for dealing with that. So when large patch is kind of a cool season fungus that shows up, it, it's already in the soil, it's already there. A lot of people say, hey, how do I completely get rid of it? Mm -hmm. Well, if you went and put a whole bunch yeah. of Clorox on your lawn, yeah. you could really get rid of it. Yeah. But the problem is, is that your grass yeah. is gonna be extremely yellow. <laughs> <laughs> or brown. Or brown, yeah. yeah. So it's something that does show up when those temperatures and, and by the way, you know, do not recommend trying to do that. That's not one of the things. That, mm -hmm. It's just a comparison to say, you know, hey, you could get rid of it, but you're going to also get rid of everything else. Um, but it's always there. It's whether the grass is susceptible or not. Mm -hmm. And also has to do with the timing of which you applied some fertilizer, too, mm -hmm. because if you, you know, go out there and apply fertilizers mm -hmm. in the perfect timing for this fungus to start growing, it's like throwing gasoline on a fire. It's just going to make it worse. So some of the some of the triggers would be temperature. Mm -hmm. Temperature. So uh, temperatures below about sixty eight degrees between you know, fifty to sixty eight degrees when we get those nighttime temperatures there, and then temperatures in the eighties during the day. You Mild. know, kind of mid to low eighties. Uh, that triggers it. And mm -hmm. so what what it does is it attacks the growing point, which like especially with St. Augustine, the growing points right there where those leaf blades connect mm -hmm. uh, to the runner, to the runner. And what it does is it affects it and makes it like very mushy, Just so rot, rots, it rots it. it. And so what you get is you get some outer leaves that are brown or okay. tan color. And if you try to pull one of those, it separates very easily. Mm -hmm. and it it just comes loose. Mm -hmm, it just comes loose because it's real mushy right yeah. around that growth point. So, um, you know, well, we have moisture. You remember the old mm -hmm. disease triangle? Mm -hmm. We've got the moisture, so we have the environmental conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, we got the host, and we definitely have the pathogen. Mm -hmm. So the only thing we have control over is the water mm -hmm. it, from that degree. Or, or fertilizer. Fertilizer, or yeah, the yeah. water and fertilizer. So mm -hmm. if we're doing it early enough, then we shouldn't have an issue. Yeah. And we're using lower nitrogen-type mm -hmm. products, especially in the fall. Um so that'll help us kind of alleviate some of that issue if, okay. if it's still there. Uh, I always kind of say, to, you know, take notes. Uh, my my house that we had in, in uh, Montgomery area, I had spots that would show up every year. Well, okay, why? I wasn't fertilizing because I'm like you. I don't mm -hmm. mess with it. We don't have time to mess with our Cobblers own stuff. Cobbler's kids yeah. go barefoot. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> don't go to the electrician's house and he's got exposed wires. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's so we're sitting there looking at it and going, hmm, I'm still getting it here and here. Well, low spots. So if you have low spots, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and if you have real clay soil, I say, you know, put some sand in there. Bring those spots up. Allow that area to dry out or even sandy loam for that matter. Um, that way you're not holding so much moisture in those areas. So if you can get rid of the low spots. That's a benefit. Yeah. The other thing is, you know, when you foresee that you're, you've, you already know you get it in one spot and you see a cold front that's going to come and drop our temperatures like that, turn off your water. You know, mm -hmm. um, one of the little tricks I've tried to do is in my yard, 
not, you know, research based, but I kind of lower my mower as we get into the fall Mm -hmm. Uh, in that way through, you know, plant pathology, my my little bit of background plant pathology is let's dry the area out. Mm -hmm. You know, what we try to do is conserve water during the summer, let it grow up as high as we possibly can to eliminate, you know, evaporation and, Mm -hmm. and try to, you know, shade the soil. Well, if we go the other direction, then we can allow for air penetration through there and dry it out so we don't have the environmental conditions. Well, when those conditions come, the disease that's present takes off and and grows. That's true of a lot of disease situations in the lawn and garden and landscape Mm -hmm. and whatnot. Uh, But if you're going to treat it, you have to preempt that. And so lawns that have had large patch year after year after year, Mm -hmm. just figure it's coming and go ahead and preempt it. Uh, If you never had it, well, you could get it, but uh, maybe it's not so important. I, I hate to recommend spraying when you don't see the disease, uh, you know, because yes. it could be wasted. Right. But in this case, the, if you spray after you see the disease, those brown spots, the grass is going into winter and it's not going to grow new blades. Mm-hmm. And so you get the brown all winter all until winter. it warms up. And then here comes the regreen because right. it doesn't kill the grass right. typically. It does uh, delay spring itself. green up. Yeah, that's the one thing it does do. It will yeah. delay spring green up, and and some of these mild mm-hmm. winters, it'll persist through the whole winter, and mm-hmm. you'll have kind of resurgence of it come and go. Mm-hmm. And I've seen that quite a bit, a bit, especially in one of the neighborhoods that I lived in. So. All right, and then take all, take all, take all is a, the game changer. Yeah, you know it. It there, it was well named. Mm-hmm. Take all, take root it all. Rot. That mm-hmm. is tells you everything you need to know. Yes, it does. Yeah, yeah. We've um, you know we start to see symptoms in the spring. Uh, you get some minor yellowing in the grass. Uh, mm-hmm. Sometimes it looks a little bit like iron chlorosis, maybe, mm-hmm. or even nitrogen. Uh, mm-hmm. But what happens is that grass just slowly recedes mm-hmm. and starts to die. And, and uh, kind of, you know, somebody says, well, how do I know it's not chinch bugs? Well, chinch bugs is very quick moving, and you will have leaves that are still attached, and it'll st- the grass is still there. Mm-hmm. It, with take all root rot, it just kind of falls apart. Mm-hmm. That, that those leaf blades start to fall off. And the next thing you, you have all these dead runners. Um, I get people in, in my county to bring them in. So I have microscopes and everything. Mm-hmm. I can get in there and look and, you know, see what they have and yeah. see if they have it. Um, so we try to, you know, tell people, you know, you have it. So let's treat it in some way, shape or form. The research that you and I've discussed many mm-hmm. times out of Carnes County, they use sphagnum peat moss, mm-hmm. a real eighth, you know, eighth of an inch treatment. Mm-hmm. And, and this is not one of those things, or it's kind of like the disclaimer is just because eighth of an inch works, two inches won't. Yeah. You, know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, eighth of an inch, it's a real light dusting, um, plus some micronutrients of some type. They you put know, some iron on iron it, I think, in right. County. Yeah. yeah. And, and so that'll help kind of boost the grass. And that's what, that's what mm-hmm. it's supposed to do. It's supposed to boost the grass so it's not as susceptible. Yeah. yeah. It, and the same thing with a fungicide. You preempt it to say, okay, I know that I start getting these issues around, let's just say for sake, May 1. Well, I need to back up and say, okay, a week or two before that is when I need to put out this fungicide mm-hmm. so I can limit the symptoms and the disease issue along the way. Okay. So not that it cures it. Right. It's just going to slow it down and it's going to allow that grass to strengthen. Well, it, it goes, I, I'm always anthropomorphizing between people and plants, but I, I think it works. Yeah. If you don't sleep, if you don't eat right, you know, mm-hmm. and you're burning the candle at both, both ends, ends and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. you're more likely to get sick right. than somebody who is mm-hmm. doing everything to maintain their, their eight hours. Now, can, and... can, I, can the, you know, the marathon runner get sick? Of course, mm-hmm. but. The point is that when you weaken the patient, your 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 problems, and that's what we're talking about right. with our grass. Exactly. So uh, I think that with the the take all, just making sure that you do everything you can to strengthen that plant mm-hmm. is is really important. And I'm afraid that we've gone past, and a lot of them have been stressed to the point where we're going to see more take all. Right. Uh, I've I've seen it uh, in drought years. Mm-hmm. Uh, Often, at following a drought year, it seems worse. Mm-hmm. But I've also noticed uh, some of the the herbicides, and we're going to get to weeds in a minute. Mm-hmm. Some of the herbicides uh, have a stressful effect on grass. Without going into all the details, yeah. uh, and where where in fact, uh, one of our turf uh, specialists here years ago, 
uh, had a lawn, his lawn next to another lawn, and the, the other guy used some herbicide things that stressed it, and take all just took off over there, and it wasn't on his side of the line. Right. And that's, again, that reminder right. that it weakened the grass, mm-hmm. and people misapply. Right. Uh, you probably can match me with <laughs> stories about oh, yes. a teaspoon's good, a oh. tablespoon's better, uh, because a lot of these herbicides are, are DNA mm-hmm. uh, type herbicides, which it, when the seed of a weed tries to send out a root, it just stops it, right. and it, and it desiccates and dies mm-hmm. right there. Well, when your grass runner tries to put down a root, mm-hmm. it can stop it too, yeah. and you end up with these little clubbed, yes. clubbed ends. And so I know you know people yep. that double their application. Right. People that apply it and then two weeks later think, eh, maybe that wasn't enough. Have you ever mm-hmm. seen those? Oh, yes. In fact, um, there was a, a commercial company that called me and said, hey, need you to come look at this lawn. And I went out there and I was like, oh, wow. I mean, you could literally grab yeah. some runners and just, and just pick up. up a 10 by 10 area. They were just sitting on the ground. They, that's all yeah. they were. And, it, and the funny thing was is that it was a newly established lawn. Mm. The guy had fired three different companies so he was on his third company oh boy and so they had all put applied. a pre-emergent out mm-hmm. <laughs> and so i'm just like wow <laughs> wow this is going to be expensive yeah you know yeah that's and it takes those a while to wear off they're right. made to last a while mm-hmm. so that they keep fighting weeds right and, and the more rain you get you mm-hmm. know like in our area you know we, we get a little bit more rain yeah. than you guys so it'll leach out eventually yeah. so you know my recommendation at that point was here let's Let's try to do some top dressing in here. Right. You know, you're going to have to water, but, mm-hmm. you know, hopefully we'll get some root systems down and, and that, that stuff will leach out. Give, you it, know, give it the best chance we can. Rather than bringing in two uh, full 18-wheeler loads of turf grass because that's how big it was. Wow. Yeah. Oh, man. Save money. Well, so let's do go to weeds. So we just mm-hmm. kind of got through saying when you use products to prevent weeds, don't overdo it. Right. Uh Stress lawns mm-hmm. uh, start to die back, right. and wherever sunlight hits the soil, nature plants a weed. Mm-hmm. And so a lawn that went through this summer, and maybe you watered enough to keep it alive, but just kind of on the line there, mm-hmm. would be more likely to have fall weed germination for our cool season weeds. Which right. ar- around here, it's kind of a maybe late September, maybe early October application right. of the pre-emerges. Correct. You want to get ahead of all the weed germination. It's kind of like playing baseball. Yes. You want to swing when the ball's there, not after it's in the catcher's hands, you know? Exactly. So it's more successful that way. Yes. <laughs> That's very true. So, so timing those is important. But uh, let's talk a little bit about that, the the use of pre-emergence mm-hmm. and the weeds and yeah. maybe this year being one that is a little more significant. Correct. And, and that's, that's the thing. Grass is already stressed out as it is. Why would we want to continue to add more stress to it? It's mm-hmm. going to be trying to rejuvenate itself. So yeah. why do we need to put about a pre-emergent down? Well, if it's trying to regrow itself. You're going to do the take off your glasses with the weeds thing, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah. We, we, we can grow ourselves out of most weed problems. Mm-hmm. We have some that coexist with St. Augustine right. very well. Indicator uh, weeds. And again, yeah. <laughs> uh, but in general, uh, mow water and fertilize right mm-hmm. all through the year. Right. Uh, each of the practices you need to be doing at that mm-hmm. time of year, and and you end up choking out your weeds. Right. But folks are going in now, so I think there's going to be an interest in trying to prevent, prevent the, weeds the weeds that might come up. Yeah. Uh, so there's that balancing act of. Yeah, I mean, you know, how severe is it? Um, you know, did your lawn really go? dormant and have you know get the take all and mm-hmm. get you know all the issues yeah. so now it's extremely stressed then i would you know kind of think twice about it and, and, and maybe even consider you know maybe in the spring i'll just replant I'll, yeah i'll get rid of those weeds in those areas and then just replant just then. replant mm-hmm. yeah so, hey, uh for those of you listening you're probably wondering what's going on here today uh, i'm visiting with michael potter michael is the county extension agent in horticulture it, with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension in Montgomery County, stationed over in Conroe. And we're just talking about lawns and the lo- what our lawns have gone through and where do we go from here. So right now we're, we're in the winter weed discussion. Winter weed. Uh, and so there, there's, um, you know, as the grass gets, as it cools off and becomes dormant, some of the products that are post-emergent that would be so hard on it in the heat mm-hmm. are not as hard on, on the grass. And right. so there is a possibility of catching the weeds early mm-hmm. before they do 
I, I use blue bonnets as our example because they, they sprout, they have a little rosette through the winter, and then mm -hmm. in spring they take off growing and bloom and set seed. As soon as those soil That's what hit. henbed's doing and mm -hmm. chickweed's doing and mm -hmm. uh, clovers. Yeah, yeah, all yeah, those are doing. They're all so ready. catching them ahead of that before they become reproductive right. with the post-emergent might be another strategy. Yes, exactly. And that, that's one of those things, a lot of those, those especially those broadleaf herbicides, mm -hmm. have that label that says, do not apply above 85 degrees. Yep. And, and and so I, I've seen the, the adverse of that. I've seen mm -hmm. where people have gone in and sprayed, you know, yeah. when it's 95 degrees outside and yeah. they wonder why they lost their lawn. And, and it, it's one of those things that, you know, make sure you read the label. Mm -hmm. A lot of these products can hurt your lawn. Um, you know, the whole aspect, like we were talking about mowing, you know, I always tell people if you mow often enough, mm -hmm. you're going to reduce weed seed head, especially with the grassy grassy weeds. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, you know, people don't do that. Mm -hmm. They, you know, let it go a little too far. Well, then you've mowed more than the one third of the grass leaf blade off. Okay. So you're stressing the grass out a little bit. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we add stress. We're overwatering because we you're trying to overcompensate. Right. You know, right. if it doesn't look right, we need to add more water. Yeah. That's that misconception. Or, or fertilizer. Or fertilizer. You can't replace sunlight with fertilizer. Right. Mm -hmm. So those yeah. kind of things. Uh, the weed that I'm seeing just mm -hmm. everywhere now, and as the lawn dies, mm -hmm. uh, this beautiful blue green weed that goes flat because we're mowing the lawn. Uh, slender aster, roadside okay. aster. The, the, yeah. I see different names, but uh, it is about to bloom. And last year, I had some on my edge of my lawn where they're kind of coming in from a neighbor's yard. Mm -hmm. And I would just go out on Saturday mornings, make sure the soil is moist because it comes out of a tap root, right. and just fill a few five-gallon buckets, yeah. you know, over on the yeah. side. And and one day I looked at the blooms, which are really pretty, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> dime-sized, <laughs> yeah. and I, I counted the seeds in one. There was like 50 seeds. Oh. And then I looked at a big plant, and it had like 100 blooms. And it's like, okay, multiply 50 oh, times 100, oh. and if you do not pull that plant mm -hmm. out before it, the seeds, seeds are released, mm -hmm. that's what you've sentenced yeah. yourself to. And it's just mm – -hmm. I know people don't want to hand pull, and yeah. but there's a time when – you know, again, once it's reproductive, right. it's too late to spray yeah. the things that would have controlled it earlier on. Yeah, I, I, and my, some people tell me I tortured my kids as they were growing up, but my 19-year-old came home from college one weekend, and I asked him, hey, could you mow the lawn for me? He said, yeah, I'll do it. And I was waiting for about, you know, 10 minutes. I didn't hear anything, so I, was like, I went outside, and he was approaching me with a bouquet of weed seed heads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, he, and he goes, he looks at me and he says, what? <laughs> and then I was like, oh, nothing. And he threw them in the trash can. And I was just like, wow. Wow. You know, it, but, and that, that was just, it, we had some bahia grass spot that right. was just kind of, you know, popping some seed heads up. So I, yeah. re, why not reduce the seeds, right. you know, reduce that, you know, proliferation of seeds. And same thing, just mowing mm -hmm. itself, the yeah. act of mowing, you're, you're, cutting this grass enough right. to where it's not being able to reproduce those seed heads. Mm -hmm. So you're reducing the population for future. That, that's important. We talk about don't bag it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've got a lawn full of weeds that are blooming and putting seeds out, that would be a time to bag it. Yeah, especially uh, if you like seeing burrs and get stuff that like that. Get that out of there. Those kind of things. Well, yeah. that's all good. Uh, so coming into next spring mm -hmm. then when weather warms up uh, when do you tell people to start fertilizing uh when the grass is actively growing and, okay. and that's you know with warm season turf grasses that we have here and it's between 75 and 85 degrees uh, that's when those turf grasses start to grow and, and then another way to look at it which a lot of our publications say is you know after the third mowing mm -hmm. um i like to kind of go the other route and say hey if you're going to have to mow almost twice a week mm -hmm. that's when that grass is actively growing if you're having to mow like once every 10 days yeah. It's and mowing slow. weeds doesn't count. Right. <laughs> or, or leaves. It, yeah. Is the grass right. awake? Yeah. Is it, is it saying, hey, I need moisture. I need, yeah. you know, fertilizer. That, okay. That's one. And that's also what we say, you know, if that's when to start watering. Mm -hmm. And that's also when to start fertilizing. Good. So. Well, there's a lot of good information out there. Mm -hmm. Well, I know a lot of people are discouraged uh, with the mm -hmm. lawns the way they are. Uh, but. Uh, you know the saying, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got some new, uh, I don't want to have to get into specific cultivars and stuff, but yeah. we have a lot of new uh, breeding work that's been done on turf. And right. so if you lost a lawn and it was the old standard St. Augustine or Saint Raleigh Augustine or who, or Raleigh, yeah. who knows what you have, uh, one way you could look at this is this is a time to make a decision. Maybe you want to switch species or maybe you want to um, uh, go with one of the new ones. Mm -hmm. I know... Texas A&M is re releasing one soon here. I don't, 
I don't think, is it commercially out there? Okay. Yeah. All right. It Just want to make sure it is. Yeah. I, uh, why don't you talk about that one? Cobalt. Cobalt. Yep. Cobalt. Uh, and it's funny, there was, there was a turf grass a few years ago that was supposed to come out. Mm -hmm. And what happened, it was out in the fields, they were growing it, mm -hmm. and they had some problems with it. They didn't, oh, guess what? We're not going to produce this sucker. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I they went back to the that. drawing board. I remember that. And then they came up with cobalt. Mm -hmm. and, and cobalt is a, a, a like a dwarf type mm -hmm. uh, St. Augustine. It, it grows extremely slow. Mm -hmm. I was talking to, um, we actually put some research plots at our extension office. Mm -hmm. And um, I was talking to one of the growers and he said, this stuff grows too slow. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm going to have to like triple my field size yeah. or wait three years before yeah. I can get it out there because it just yeah. grows so slow, which is good because in a sense, it means that you're going to reduce your mowing, mm -hmm. you're going to reduce water, and you're going to reduce your fertilization. So what, but, but it has a feature that is really new and unique for St. Augustine and that that's its drought, drought tolerance. tolerance. Yeah. Right. Its ability to, mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, not, it, approaching like Bermuda's right. ability to, to hang on and survive, which is right. rare for St. Right. Augustine. So coming out of a year like this, mm -hmm. and which was the year before also, also. like this, mm -hmm. uh, this might be a time to look for a new grass. Correct. Yeah. And, and, and I always kind of tell people that you might want to invest in some technology because mm -hmm. that, that's basically what it is. It's technology to have that resistance or mm -hmm. you know be able to survive in, in these drought conditions over a little bit longer period of time yeah. um, there's a lot of research out there that that san antonio water system yeah. saws project was a, a key component of saying oh wow this right. stuff could be good right. um, back when i was living in corpus i had floritam uh, which we don't recommend up here because it's a little bit has not as good cold tolerance mm -hmm. um, it was great I mean, I, I remember doing research on it and finding in Florida where a guy was holding a piece of sod and it had root systems 14 to 16 inches deep. And I'm going, yeah. that's what I need. Yeah. You know, rainfall down in, in Corpus Christi area was only 25 to 28 inches a year. Yeah. Up here, you know, we're looking anywhere, you know, y'all are yeah. like 35, 40. Mm -hmm. We're like 42 to 50, mm -hmm. you know, unless you have a hurricane and, yeah. and then it blows it out of the water. But yeah. it, those, that technology and everything is there in these newer varieties. And we have to, I, I think it, it deserves a good look. Okay. Well, you're listening to Garden Success, and we're coming to you by tape today. I'm visiting with Michael Potter, who is the horticulture agent in Montgomery County over in Conroe. Uh, and we had him over here yesterday training the master gardeners in the new class. And so we just talked him into coming back for, for the radio show. I appreciate Return that. Return trip. By Thank you. Way, by the way, when I'm saying yesterday, it was last week yesterday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. That's this okay. A week ago. <laughs> uh, well, we, we've talked a lot about turf, mm -hmm. but let's expand it a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I often tell people that when you get to the end of a brutal summer, that is a good time to get up early in the morning when it's a little cooler, grab a cup of coffee, whatever, walk around and just look. Mm -hmm. What you're going to see is grass is going to be probably alive under the trees and dead out in the sun if, mm -hmm. if it's marginal. Uh, you're going to see plants that are in a little too much sun and they just didn't do well mm -hmm. at all. Or maybe plants that are in a little too much shade, shade yeah. and need a little bit more sun. Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe... Uh, gosh, driving to the station today, I was surprised at how many shrubs in front of houses were yes. completely brown mm -hmm. uh, to the point where I think they're dead. Yeah. Oh, yes. uh, and so, again, here's that opportunity. We have a lot of new shrubs. We have a lot of different mm -hmm. kinds. of. We have more drought-resistant plants. We have plants that used to get it up to the eaves of your house, and now there's more compact types. Right. Uh, so let's talk a little bit of a, about a landscape evaluation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, where uh, and, and that this, that's, that's where you start, you know get out there and kind of look uh, i always you know we've got the same situation in montgomery county you go drive down some of the neighborhoods and there's just shrubbery gone yeah i mean they're just they're dead they're totally brown well mm -hmm. why and, and i kind of same thing with trees too i mean there's some very large live oaks that i've seen just totally brown really and it's wow okay why mm -hmm. well everything's compounded if you think about it it's yeah. everything that has happened from the beginning of that tree's yes. or that shrub's life cycle. Right. Maybe it was stressed out when it planted. Here we go with the stress right. thing. It, it kind of slowly decreases their lifespan. Yeah. And, you know, you've got, um, in fact, when I moved up here in 2011, 2012, you know, I remember big drought. Um, the lake was down at Lake Conroe was down 13 foot. People were driving on the edge of the shorelines wow. and stuff like that. And then the biggest thing was 
listening to the Forest Service talk about all the trees that were lost out in the forest mm -hmm. and, and, and seeing, you know, I mean, you, and you know, it's bad when Yopon yeah. dies. And I read somewhere, and it was a Forest Service assessment, that mm -hmm. they estimated 300 million trees in Texas Correct. died in that 2011 drought. Yes. And our conditions here in College Station were about equal to that, if mm -hmm. not, depending on what you're measuring, uh, maybe yeah. a little worse. So uh, think about all those trees that went through that and made right. it through it. Mm -hmm. But the fact is they were impacted by it. Right. So, you know, when people call me and say, well, I've got some limbs that are dying, you know, whether it be shrubs or, or trees, mm -hmm. that's the first thing we need to think about. Well, are they getting overwatered? Yeah. You know, because they might be completely saturating the soil, no oxygen to the root right. system, so the root systems are just decaying. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be that they were impacted many years of droughts and maybe not taken care of properly. Yeah. And so you're seeing the effects of that. Okay. So it's a compounded effect. I mean, we've got, um, there was a, a tree that was on my, on my way to the office, beautiful, big, oak tree, fluffy. Oh, it's just, I was like, man, beautiful tree mm -hmm. sitting out there. You know, it doesn't get any water. It's been there for years. I come through one day and I'm like, that tree doesn't look good. Yeah. A week later, it is totally, totally brown. brown. Yeah. And it's just, it finally said, I can't do it anymore. I'm yeah. like, it's enough. A, a lot of trees, you know, they are resilient, but mm -hmm. as they get weakened, just like we talked about St. Augustine getting it's weakened, uh, our, uh, we have a lot of oaks here and hypoxylin canker is yes. just wrecks havoc on them. And mm -hmm. after this year, I bet we see a lot more hypoxylin right. uh, coming in because it's the opportunist too. It's in mm -hmm. the tree, but it it, mm -hmm. it gets a chance, the upper hand when the tree gets weakened. And, right. Uh, so, you know, we're at this point now. So doing a landscape evaluation really gives you a chance to think about things. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is improving the soil in some areas because just having a better, deeper, more extensive root system because the soil has been improved can make a big difference a during difference. a drought mm -hmm. and other things. Maybe redesigning beds, mm -hmm. uh, some, you know, the right. b where they're located and do you c reconsidering where you have turf. Yeah. You know, and I know it, it is a Texas tradition <laughs> that if you own property, it, you north, south, east, west, anything, any bare dirt mm -hmm. needs turf on it. Yep. Right. Right. And, but in realistic, where do you, really use the turf where do you most want the turf yeah and, what is its utilization right. i mean is it for recreation for your kids to play in the yard right. is it you know just for the dogs to not track mud right. in the house i mean there's a lot of things yeah that make you know to make those considerations as yeah. far as what you do or an area that this summer you could not get watered well maybe that area needs some drought tolerant other options right uh, yeah and, just natural uh, i've always said you know if you keep your yard mode nobody will ever know the difference yeah it's green's good i mean it's, 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 green's good I, I think i don't know if i've talked to you this before but you know who felder rushing is yes. he's mm -hmm. mississippi uh, he said something one time that has always stuck with me he said you make every weed problem in your lawn go away instantly by taking off your glasses, glasses. i like <laughs> it. it it's really mm -hmm. true because if you keep it mowed it yeah. looks pretty good exactly and that's what i tell homeowners i said you know hey go in there after you mow the yard, right. get cleaned up, go get in your car, drive around the block and pretend it's not your house. Right. And I even show people the picture yeah. of my yard yeah. and they go, oh, by the way, when I go closer, this yeah. is what's in my yard. A lot of weeds. And they go, oh, yeah. well, so you didn't see them, did you? Well, I know people listening to the show, we've got a range. We've mm -hmm. got people that don't even want to have a lawn. Right. They just want it to be wild nature and yep. native and all that. And that, that's fine. Mm -hmm. And then we have people that if they have a St. Augustine front yard and it looks like the golf course, uh, and it has one broadleaf weed, which stands out like a neon sign in, yes. in Bermuda grass. <laughs> yes. uh, you know, that's then not, not they're, acceptable. They're so you got to figure aircraft. out where you are. Yeah, <laughs> where where you are on the spectrum. But right. th the reality is that uh, if you can tolerate and if you can be patient, uh, yeah. maybe you can grow your way out of a lot of problems. And I would I would encourage people to talk to their county extension office. Right. Uh, there are some weeds that you're not you're not they're not going to go away right you know, they they're just going to be persistent mm -hmm. and then there's others that yes block the light and you, you've mm -hmm. got this under control right yeah and you know i think you know going back to the the landscape portion of it you know reevaluating it you know we've got a lot more pine trees in montgomery county mm -hmm. so we have shade problems do you still because they were clearing them out yeah. year by well, year by year. there are so yeah they are still <laughs> clearing them out but we yeah. still have shade problems you know uh, especially in the woodlands area there's a yeah. lot of trees that are still there intact and 
you know, you've you've got to look at it from that standpoint. If, if I'm not able to grow that turf grass underneath that tree, mm-hmm. then I need to consider something else. Yeah. You know, and, and possibly, you know, landscape mulch, you know, something else, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, and really look at your plant selection. Right. You know, there is. A, and it's like we said, technology with with the new turf grasses there's a lot of good technology out there plants that have been bred for these conditions Mm -hmm. that'll just survive i i I had a a esperanza in front of my house and it actually succumbed to the freeze Mm -hmm. and i you know i was sitting there thinking oh i'm gonna have to replace it you know it did Mm -hmm. it did nail it okay Mm -hmm. i didn't think about it i had to pull it out with my truck (laughs) with a chain i was amazed one year's growth yeah. Because it was a younger plant. It had quite a root system. It had an, a very elaborate root system. Yeah. I was like, wow, now I know why. Yeah. You know. Well, making those decisions, is it's a good time. And I nobody wants to have experienced what we experienced. But right. I would just say to listeners, take advantage of where we are now mm-hmm. because there are some opportunities that you wouldn't have had before. Mm-hmm. before right? yeah. Most people are not going to go into a perfectly beautiful, healthy lawn and go, I'm going to rip all that out and I'm going to rip all that out. Right. But uh, now's the time when maybe you need to think about that. Yeah. Just, you know, get out and maybe even do some sketches of what you would yeah. like to see. And I always tell people when I teach, you know, sometimes I teach landscape design and I've done it a lot, uh, you know, drive around. Yeah. Look and see what's out there. Look and see, you know, commercially, from a commercial building perspective, some, what they're using, uh, the plant material or actually the design part of it. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you don't see a lot of mustache hedges anymore. Yeah. All, you know, the, yeah. all of them in a row. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a lot of times when I do designs, I try to get it where those plants are further apart. Mm-hmm. And the reason why is because when you have two plants in direct competition, mm-hmm. somebody's got to give eventually. Okay. You know, and so if you're doing like a hedge and you have four or five of them in a row, one of them dies, what do you do? Yeah. 10 years down the road. Yeah. Well, that's going to cost you. That's a good point. So what are some plants that you particularly like in light of the fact that it's been a rough year. Uh, you kind of get to looking around town and kind of get impressed with some things maybe you you hadn't thought about. Before. I'll start off with, okay. one, with one. And uh, this is far from a super, super drought tolerant plant. But we were in, when I was in Travis County at the Extension Office, we had a plumbago, blue plumbago out front. Mm-hmm. And our water, there was a, a line break problem. And for, I don't know, 60 days, we didn't have any water we could water the whole landscape with. Mm-hmm. And plants died all over the place. The plumbago looked horrible. But when we started watering, it came right back okay. out. And I thought, I never considered that a drought tolerant plant. But right. that example, after 2011, the master gardeners up in north central Texas mm-hmm. went through town doing that kind of assessment. And one of the top plants on their list was rosemary. Mm-hmm. Uh, rosemary is it's an evergreen shrub in fact or a lot it of, can be or yeah. a ground cover a lot of people make the mistake of overwatering it yes that'll kill it quick mm-hmm. and especially in the winter uh, but do you have some plants that maybe you, you think of like maybe this should be used a little bit more yeah I, I'm looking at a lot of the salvias okay I, I kind of like the, the nature type stuff mm-hmm. you know I want to attract the butterflies I want to attract the bees yeah uh, you know some of those dark purple salvias yeah. I, I like those um, you know uh, Palace, uh, Castle, uh, Artemisia, Artemisia. That's yeah. a great one. You know, it, it takes over, does pretty well. Um, I, the lantanas, I think, are, mm-hmm. are great. That can be pretty tough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we just got through looking at. Um, we had one of our professional development retreats. We went out to one of the big nurseries, and mm-hmm. they had a research garden, and they had all these new types of lantanas that were mm-hmm. out there. It's kind of interesting. I was like, wow, this one just has a number, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Yep. And, and so it was really, really good to see something, you know, some new stuff coming down the pipe. Those are good. And, you know, I want to remind people listening, too, that there's plants that survive drought and there's plants that look good during drought. Mm-hmm. And those don't overlap a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for example, uh, we used to, when buffalo grass came out, it was going to be the, you don't have to water it, thing. perfect grass. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it is it is resilient, but every weed on earth uh, just takes it over right. here in, where it rains. But it knew how to turn brown in the summer exactly. and wait for rain to come rather right. than the St. Augustine approach of mm-hmm. I'm just going to stay green until I die Right, uh, kind of approach. And that, that works well. You've got plants like agave. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Now, I realize, first of all, when we're talking about 
drought tolerant plants. I'm not saying rocks and cactus all through College Station and Bryan and <laughs> whatnot. We're, we're not. It's not a zero scape. Yeah. It's a zero scape. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's a difference. Exactly. But but an agave, you can dig it up in July and throw it in the back of your pickup and drive around until sometime in August. August. Stick it in the ground. It takes off growing, mm-hmm. and and it you know it looks good. 12 months out of the year. Right. Uh, there are plants that look good during grout, but then there's others that just know how to survive it. And I think with our, if this trend toward hot and dry mm-hmm. continues, uh, I think we're going to have to look at maybe a different approach to landscapes. And right. I know there's HOAs, there's yep. a lot of issues out there. But Jill Noakes, who is a native plant writer in Austin, Texas, mm-hmm. she made a statement one time. These things stick with me. Oh, yeah. uh, she said, Tawny is a color too. and, and <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> the, exactly. The, the, sometimes just accepting it's there, but you know what? When the rain comes back, that it's plant's back. back. Mm-hmm. I didn't lose the plant, and right. it'll look good pretty quick. And Right. I don't know. We're we're wandering all over the place here, but yeah. there's a lot of things yeah. to think about right now. Yeah, the there landscape. are. You know, and it's it, it's funny how it's cyclical, mm-hmm. and it's it's we we have these little droughts. They'll come sometimes a year or two in a in a row, and then all of a sudden yeah. we're fine for a while, yeah. and then all of a sudden we get the deluge. Yeah. So you know, it it's just the cycle of life yeah. in a sense. Uh, so yeah, there there are a lot of plants that are out there that are really good for the landscapes, and I, I mean I think now is a good time to start thinking about that mm-hmm. from that perspective and looking and saying you know hey what do I like. And I tell people, walk around the nursery. Yeah. Look, ar- look around. See what yeah. you like. I liked your thing of driving through town, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and seeing uh, that. You'll pick up some things like, what is that? Yes. You know, and, and find out. Yes. And now with all the apps and everything where you can identify oh stuff. You know? yeah. You know, yeah. Some of them are kind of off. But, you know, yeah. then sometimes I go, oh, no, 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 that's not it. I know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Well, I like salvias, too. You yeah. mentioned those. And yeah. uh, when you're talking about the deep purple ones, mm-hmm. uh, uh, the uh, salvia garnetica uh, uh, that has the, the purplish blue mm-hmm. uh, blooms, mm-hmm. uh, hummingbirds love it. Yes. And we're in September. Oh. This is hummingbird season, right? Hummingbird As bush. they're passing through. Amelia. Uh, there's a lot There's, of plants like that mm-hmm. that are not only resilient, but also offer some other benefits mm-hmm. that maybe I, we don't have. I've got, um, in the front of my landscape, I've got pink mealy grass. Mm. And this, I mean, this is out in the middle mm-hmm. of nowhere, and I, I do have irrigation to it, mm-hmm. but it's a very sandy soil. Mm. And I've watered maybe three times the whole summer. Okay. And I've got pink mealy. <laughs> I've got a Vitex tree out there. And I've got Vitex some of the, is tough. Mm-hmm, that it is. is tough. And I've got some uh, firecracker plants. All right. And, 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 you know, that's that's the way it rolls. All right. Well, you have been listening to Garden Success, and I'm your host, Skip Richter. We've been visiting with Michael Potter. Michael is the county extension horticulture agent in Montgomery County over in Conroe, and we have just about covered everything about what just hit us this summer and what we might do about it mm-hmm. uh, uh, going forward. Michael, I really appreciate you coming over and taking time to do this. Oh, I was I as well. It, it's, it's been a pleasure. I, I really appreciate being able to work with you on something. Well, so. good, good. Uh, It's great. Well, we'll be back live again next week. So remember, Garden Success is available by podcast. If you would like to, uh, whatever your podcast app is, search. If it doesn't have Garden Success, get a different app because some of them do (laughs) and most of them do. Uh, And if you want to listen to past shows, you can also go to the website, uh, the KAMU-FM website. Look for Garden Success and you can click on and listen to past shows on there as well. Well, We're going to close it down. We look forward to visiting with you again next Thursday. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.